Hi, it's Clark, and today I'm going to talk about capitalism, the stock market, and how you can use it to your advantage. In this series, we talk about how to live a more intentional life by focusing on five things. Defining your enough, what you need to be happy, and how you can prepare for that life. Understanding investment theory, what you need to know to get there. Developing good habits and motivations to help you along the way. And actually doing it, specific steps to work towards your enough goal. Lastly, finding community so you can connect with others striving to live an intentional life. Today, we're talking about my theory of how the stock market works and how you can use it to your advantage. Before we can talk about the stock market, we need to talk about economic systems. I'm going to talk about three of them here. Feudalism, Marxism, and capitalism. All of them, from our purposes, have the most to do with who controls the means of production. Feudalism is like kings, warlords, you know, old times, knights, that kind of a deal. It went on for a while and it still exists in some places. Uh, the idea is some strong man through either uh, controlling a large army or having the best weapons or whatever his trick was, has gotten control of an area. And he owns that area. He owns the means of production. So he controls the land and he controls the people who work the land serfs. It's probably better than anarchy for the serfs. They don't have people coming in and robbing them, uh, but it's not the greatest system. Nothing that we want to do. But that's when one guy owns the means of production. Karl Marx wrote a book on uh, another form of government. We call that Marxism. It includes communism and socialism and that kind of a deal. He claims in his book that his point was that the people should own the means of production. Where it does work is like a family. If uh, you and your spouse have a bunch of kids, you don't want to raise them in a capitalist type model. You don't want to raise them in feudalism. You're basically raising them communist. You don't expect the children to have to produce their own food or make their own clothes or work for the family. You support them because you love them because you're raising them up, you're trying to make them into good people. So it works great at that scale. If you have like a commune thing going on, uh, it can work pretty good because at least you trust everybody. You don't have to love everybody there, but you have to trust that they're trying to work hard. If they're not trying to work hard and they're just kind of going along being a bit lazy, you can kick them out. But for a country, you don't have that option. If you were to essentially kick somebody out of the country, that really boils down to putting them in prison or just outright killing them. And uh, you start getting a very bad reputation when you do that. So Marxism doesn't scale up well. The problem is no Marxism model has the people owning the means of the production. Governments own the means of production. And governments, eh, they're governments. When they're at their best, they're inefficient. And when they're at the worst, well, they can be pretty bad. Marxism has been tried uh, in the Soviet Union on a huge scale. It's been tried in lots of other countries at smaller scales. It's failing miserably for the people of Venezuela right now. It just plain doesn't work with human nature. It's not scalable. The final system we're going to talk about is capitalism. Now, capitalism doesn't sound all warm and fuzzy like Marxism sounds on first blush but it actually is the very, very best system. Um, who owns the means of production of capitalism? Well, virtually anybody who would want to. You don't have to, you're not taxed into it, you don't have to own a part of a corporation because you're in the society. But if you choose to save your money and invest it in a big corporation, a publicly held corporation, you're gonna start reaping the rewards of that corporation. Everybody has that option. And that's really what makes capitalism great. It's also great because the companies that need capital have a good source of capital. And if you look out throughout history, or fairly recent history actually, you can see that the number of people that live in absolute abject poverty has gone down really a lot. And it's mostly because of the capitalist system all over the world. The thing that makes capitalism really work is its scalability. You don't have to love everyone in the group. 
You don't even have to like them or trust them. In fact, you probably really shouldn't trust everybody in a big, big city or a big country. What capitalism does for you is let's it scale beyond all those issues. So in feudalism, some strong man holds the means of production. In uh, Marxism, the government holds the means of production, which kind of boils down to a strong man when you get right down to it. And in uh, capitalism, anyone that wants to put capital in the system owns a bit of the means of production. The vehicle that a capitalist system uses to move that capital around, to allow people to invest and see the fruits of their investment, is called the stock market. Now let's take a closer look at the stock market. How does it work? Well, that's a big subject. People have doctorates in economics. I kind of boil it down to just a couple things, and I'm gonna give you my model of the stock market. If it makes sense to you, I think you'll think it's a little bit simpler than people make it. Okay, there's a bunch of people in the world, and there's more people all the time. Our population is just going up. We're breeding like rabbits on this planet. And it's a graph that looks like this. Okay. Also, over that same period of time, the standard of living of the average person on this planet has gotten a lot better. They have more money to spend. They have more discretionary income. And that graph looks like this. If you take these two graphs and you multiply them together, this is what you get. See that curve? Well, that's the smooth curve of what the stock market has done over that period of time. And you can basically count on the market growing at that speed as long as the population grows and the average standard of living grows. Now, day by day, it doesn't follow that straight line. If it did, life would be real easy. It's a very jaggedy route. There's times when it wiggles a little bit. There's times when it has great corrections. When the value of the stock market deviates from that curve, that's uh, a bubble if it's above, or it's a crash if it's below. These aren't bad things. These are things that can help you make more money. Here's the Great Depression crash. Here's the bubble and crash in 2000, the tech bubble as they called it. And here's the 2008 crash, the housing bubble. And you can see for all of these crashes, after a little time went by and people got confidence back, not only did the market start going up, it went up and joined that same curve that it would have been on no matter what, because people were still having babies and people are still being able to buy more than they could the day before. So how can we use this to our advantage? Right now, if you haven't done it already, you should go uh, watch my power of a dollar video because I'm going to use some terms that are defined in there and it tells you why you should be investing. Also, uh, there's a three-part series uh, that'll take you through the um, actual process of doing investment, opening a fund, finding an investment that's good for you and actually buying it. That can be very useful. Know that's out there. You can get to that later. Now I'm going to talk about how the market works and how you can take advantage of the dips and the bumps. The method that I use generally is just buy, always buy and hold. Buy uh, every paycheck, buy a certain amount or put the money aside every paycheck. Keep that going, keep that going. Don't worry if it's high, don't worry if it's low, just keep going. The average will be in your favor and over a period of time, say 10 years later, the difference of whether you bought it on a Monday or a Friday really doesn't mean much. The big, big sweeping things could be an issue. If you think the market is well above what the value should be, maybe you wanna put your money someplace else for a little while. But what happens more often than bubbles are crashes, and crashes are actually wonderful things. First off, remember, you haven't lost a penny until you sell your position. So if you've been buying stock and there's a crash and you go, oh no, I'm only worth half of what I was worth yesterday. No, you own the same percentage of those companies. You own exactly the same amount. It's just that those company stocks are on a bargain right now. You can buy them uh, for a very, very low price. So uh, I'll use my own example. I retired in 2000, I went out sailing. There was a crash. 
I just rode through it. I just tightened my belt and uh, didn't spend any principal and just lived as cheaply as I possibly could. And it came back up. Some years later, I was out sailing in the Eastern Caribbean and I came back and as I came back, that housing thing happened and the market crashed again. Well, I had just come back from a long multi-year sale. I was ready to be in the States for a little while and I decided, hell, this is a bargain. So even though I hadn't worked in 10 years, I went back to work for two years. And during those two years, I saved everything in the market. Boy, am I glad I did. I made more money during that period on the market growth than I did working for the company I worked for. And I think that's a good thing to do. If you're already past the fire thing, if you're already retired and there's a crash, that's a good time to go back to work. Even if you worked at McDonald's, just so you didn't have to uh, sell principal, or you work someplace that you only had a tiny bit of income, putting that income into the market at that time with all those bargains will make you a lot of money in the future. So when everybody is saying, oh, woe is me, the market is low, I got to get out. They're getting out. They're selling things at a loss. You buy them. So in conclusion, I believe in buy and hold. So buy consistently. Hold on to that. Just live off the dividend. Don't sell when things are high. Just keep it going. And by all means, keep buying when the market goes down. You're buying bargains. If you want more of my strategies, please subscribe to the channel and hit that bell. It turns out that bell is like really important. YouTube is changing everything. We'll have more videos like this one coming up. And I want to really uh, thank you all for watching. Good day.